So we're going to start part three talking about the time period between 55 and 53. And, and as we ended part two, um, back in Rome here, everything is basically chaos. The, the political machine ha is basically broken. Um, it was impossible to do anything because everywhere you turned, you had a tribune or you had a mob that was there to stop you from doing it. Bribery was huge, uh, interest rate, and inflation was rampant, and it was apparent to everybody that Rome needed a dictator, um, and, and which is a, a legal thing. You, you can vote for a dictator to take control for six months at a time. Um, Pompey would be this person, but they didn't trust him, and that is huge, considering that in the 60s, the decade prior, he was the answer to everything. Um, when pirates were interrupting trade, they gave Pompey all of the power to go against the pirates. When there was a grain shortage, they gave Pompey all of control over Rome's entire economy. Well, here, they need him again. Uh, they, they need a dictator again, but they don't trust him. Um, so this is, uh, this is chaos in Rome. Uh, to make matters worse for Caesar and the Triumvirs, Pompey's wife, Julia who is, remember, also Caesar's daughter, she dies in 54. So that glue that was holding together the triumvirate is, is, is now gone. Um, and we're also told that, that Caesar even offered um, Octavia, a, a niece, a great niece of his, uh, to replace Julia, and Pompey refused. So things are, are almost irreparably broken here. Um, back in Gaul... Caesar decides to invade Britain again. He does it more successfully this time. Um, he, um, he also is, or, or really Gaul is also getting to the point where uh, things are coming to a head. And you, you don't necessarily need to know all of these tribes, although some of them we've seen before, like, like the Nervi and the Suebi. But what's important is the scale. And so you guys can see we have these uprisings and so he comes up Caesar comes up and puts down all of these tribes uh, one by one by one by one and um, and um, yeah and, and just it, it's a very busy year of, of, of one uprising after another uh, it's important to note too that that Crassus amongst all of this unrest he is killed off in Parthia so not only does Julia die, breaking that bond between Caesar and Pompey, but, but the third triumvirate, or member anyway, triumvir, is killed. So there is no more triumvirate. Um, so let's go back to Rome now. Uh, 52, everything has come to a head. This is a, a really, really uh, infamous year in Roman history, and it has to do with these two guys, Milo and Clodius. So... Clodius, we know, is he is a um, he's up for the the praetorship at this point, and Milo is up for the consulship, and these two both have a big band of thugs at their back, and uh, they're both being used against each other by various politicians. Pompey, one of them, uh, and it happens that on January eighteenth, in fifty two, right at the beginning of the year, the the two groups are the two thugs are heading down the Appian Way, and they run into each other, and there's a huge skirmish, and Clodius is killed. Um, unbelievably, Clodius is brought, his body anyway, is brought back to Rome, put in the Curia, the Senate House, in the Forum, in a makeshift pyre, and burned. Um, th this is amazing. Uh, you know, the, the Senate which had basically been broken by all of this popular violence, is literally dismantled and burned to the ground by popular violence. I mean, no greater metaphor uh, in Roman history. So finally, the senators vote a, a, a final decree of the Senate, a synopsis consultum ultimum, and put Pompey in charge. He is declared sole consul, and has the whole Senate on his side, and he takes control of Rome. Back in Gaul, 52 is not much better <laughs> for Caesar. A lot is happening in 52. 
Um, again, a lot of names here, and you don't need to know them. We don't need to know individual battles and whatnot. But the basic idea is this. Look at all these names. All of these are Gallic tribes. All of them want to be alone. They want to do their own thing. But they all unite against Caesar under the leadership of this guy, a guy named Vercingetorix, or where King Victorix, uh, who is a, of the tribe the Averni. And, um, and, and this is an important statement that, that so many of these insular tribes want to want to rally against Caesar. And so here's another view of it, just how overwhelming the opposition is to Caesar's oppression of, of their tribal areas. So Vercingetorix organizes a huge, huge resistance against Caesar in Gaul. And again, we don't need to know exactly what happens here, but basically the, the long story short here is that there is massive casualties on both sides. Um, at, even at, at one of these, uh, one in six centurions is killed. Um, it, is, it is massive. There's a mutiny at one point of Roman soldiers that Caesar has to quell. Uh, and it all culminates in this town called Alesia. So here's another look at all of these skirmish and battle sites. And here is Alesia. And Alesia is, uh, is famous. Um, this is a, a battle, a siege, that is still studied in, in military strategy guides today. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about it. This is pretty amazing. So the long story short is that Ver Vercingetorix and about 80,000 of his uh, soldiers, of his people, are uh, they hold themselves up. They retreat, run away. They retreat into the town of Alesia, and they slam the door shut. And Caesar comes and builds siege works around it, and he is just going to wait them out. And so the, the siege works that Caesar builds are unprecedented and, um, and maybe the largest of all time. I'm not really sure, but let me give you an idea. He builds a wall 14 kilometers around the city, so about 8 or 9 miles around the city, with 23 fortifications kind of added on to it. Uh, he digs a trench that's over 20 feet wide on the side of the town. And that trench is followed up by two more trenches that are themselves about 15 feet wide. And the first of which is filled with water. You can see the, the two trenches there. Behind that, we have a, a, a ramp and a palisade that's, that's 4 meters or about 12 feet high. And then... They sink branches and dig tree trunks uh, into the ground that have sharp tips and then pits with sharpened stakes that are covered with earth and then logs with iron hooks. So this is uh, nearly unprecedented. Well, Worsen Gitterix gets word out that he's stuck in the town and 250,000 infantry come to his aid and head to the town along with 8,000 cavalry and horsemen. Well, that's, that's good news for him, but the bad news is that it takes him 30 days to get there and, and organize and get there and everything. Well, in those 30 days, they're running out of food and they don't have enough water and food for everybody. So he sends every non-fighting person out of the town of Alasia. Caesar, really, by the rules of engagement, is supposed to let them pass, take them prisoner, but, but sort of let them surrender. He doesn't do that. He sends them back to the city where they are not allowed in and they're deserted by both sides at the walls of the city and they're left there to die. Well, once the reinforcements come, they, at the same time that Vercingetorix and his people burst out of the city, they attack the Roman lines. And this is an epic battle, and it is a prime example of what an effective leader Caesar is, that he essentially fights two, two battles, uh, or a battle on two different fronts, and after a couple different iterations of the battle over a couple nights, essentially, um, he out, Caesar outmaneuvers the Gauls, defeats them, and Vercingetorix has to surrender. So he and his people come out of the town, they surrender, um, Caesar arrests Vercingetorix, he, um, he 
he keeps him with his with his army until let's fast forward a few years. He comes back to Rome. He makes Vercingetorix march back to Rome with him. He throws him in the Mamertine prison for six years. One morning he pulls him out, dresses him up on his in his clothes, marches him down the road in a triumph, and then kills him. So at the end of fifty two, and this grand victory at Alasia, Caesar basically says, "Okay, all, now all of Gaul is pacified," and the um, the consuls in Rome, Pompey, actually not the consuls, but Pompey, the sole consul, and the Senate have another twenty day supplicatio ordered for Caesar. And in the meantime, they pass a law that the tribunes pass a law um, that someone can run for office in absentia. Um, but Pompey and the Senate invalidate that law. And we'll stop right there.